Good evening, everybody, and thanks very much for coming in this evening after work. It's always a big effort to come in, and we appreciate it. Uh, this is our annual Engineers Ireland Institutional Structure Engineers Parish Conference Society uh, joint lecture, and every year we make a big effort to, to go with a kind of keynote speaker, and uh, this year is no exception. We have Mr. Alan Mann, who's a gold medal, gold medal winner with the Institutional Structure Engineers, and the Institutional Structure Engineers Gold Medal has been awarded since 1922. Uh, for technical excellence in the field, and it's an honor to have Alan here with us tonight. Previous winners include the likes of Obara, Fraser Lane, Sal Calatrav, and that's the kind of caliber of people that uh, Alan mixes with. Now, before we start properly, just to point out that the fire exits are on the way to my wagon side there, behind you, and if you could please silence your mobile phones. Um, so, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Alan uh, for a very interesting talk on team park riots. Thanks, Alan. Thank you. Thank you very much. I thought you were filming something. You want me to stand anywhere in particular? Uh, well, if you. I'll stand here, okay? Oh, okay. Good evening, everyone. Uh, this is the first time I've ever been to Cork, so I'm really privileged to have this opportunity and I had a, a walk around today, so it's very nice. Uh, what I'm going to talk to you tonight about is, is theme park rides. Now, I don't want you to think that this is a, some sort of merry-go-round. That theme parks are big business throughout the world. You know, a lot of you will have been to Disneyland or some of the big theme parks in the UK. And there's enormous worldwide projects associated with this. And like most branches of engineering, it's a fairly niche area, the same firms, the same companies work in it. And it's quite a complicated area of engineering in the sense that everything we do in building or civil or structural engineering or architecture is a mixture of typical engineering disciplines, you know, lights, electricity and ventilation in this room. But in theme parks, it's particularly well integrated. So mechanical, electrical, architecture, civil, structural, all heavily coordinated in the particular project. Right. I'll speak here. Is that all right? Right. Yeah, I know I don't speak very loudly. The theme was that it's the engineering disciplines are particularly integrated. In that. I think we have mechanical, electrical engineers tonight. Engineers Island. Yeah. Right. Very nice. And some architects. I know I've been told that architects are almost the same. You can ask about architects. So those. Integration is quite complicated, and what makes, the, what makes the project difficult is that the people in charge have to have some understanding of all the disciplines down there to work together. But I'll say something about that, and I'll try to say something of relevance to all of them. First of all, actually, make sure I'm working this properly. Which one is, which one am I going to point on? Well, let's stick with these. All right, so I'm not going to talk about rides like this. This is a ride, it's got motion, it's got a structure, it's got a motor, it's got electrical power and things like that. But this is a whole part of the theme. Rides go anywhere from bouncy castles to enormous great wheels. I'm not going to talk about these. What I will talk about is roller coasters, big wheels, and you'll get the idea of the dinosaur a bit later. It doesn't seem a bit facetious to you, but there's a particular reason why I'm putting it on. And these are significant projects. So if you look at this picture, which I concocted, that I believe is the tallest. Somebody told me, the Kieran told me it was the tallest building in Ireland today. I just thought it was the tallest building in the Cork at 79 metres. So the one on the left is 208 metres. So these projects are significant engineering projects in their own right, even if they're not just theme parks. And the other major difficulty we have, and something which should attract the attention of all of us, is that someone has to stand up and say, this ride is safe. And we all want to do that about the projects we work on. But for younger people particularly, the challenge of articulating why things are safe or not safe is extremely difficult. It's a task in its own right. Some of my background is in nuclear engineering, where we have to articulate the case about why this particular power station is safe. And, and you may be aware of this accident which took place at Old Towers two or three years ago, 
and half a dozen young people got life-changing injuries and it cost the company millions and millions of pounds. So I don't want you to think these things are unsafe because statistically you're more likely to be killed in your car driving to a theme park than you are on the park. But of course when things go wrong they attract major attention. And one of the differences between this and normal projects is that you don't say the structure is safe because it complies with a code of practice. You have to understand how all the engineering disciplines interact, what might go wrong, and design the structure, design the project so that that doesn't happen. Anyway, before I digress too much into the engineering, let me give you a, a sort of brief rundown of a ride history of where we come from. So, Throughout history, everybody wanted to be entertained. You know, those fairs, medieval fairs, there must be some in Ireland. This is a famous painting by Bruegel about the fair with people doing various amusements and things like that. That's happened since the Middle Ages. And a lot of the rides that we have now, the tradition of building rides, something purely for persons' amusement, comes from Russia. And this is a, a Russian ice slide from 1800, something like that. But obviously, just got the top come down slide on the bottom, fairly nothing much. And over time these developed as a toboggan ride from Paris in 1817, shortly after Napoleon. And people would be amused on it, some people would pay. And these amusement parks started to develop in Western Europe. And uh, sometimes it was entertained by someone else. Here's a demonstration in Manchester in 18. 45 or something, where somebody goes on and does a turn on the, on the track on his bicycle, or it looks like a lady actually, but sits on turned down, and somebody no doubt he pays some money for it. And probably the big change came towards the end of the 19th century when there was the Industrial Revolution, and lots and lots of people wanted entertainment in their weeks holiday, wakes weeks in, in, in Northern in Lancashire, and particularly in America, where people started to do things. And, uh, Develop things that were just for people to be entertained. And one of them was a, a mine train where you went through some scenic scenery and, and got a nice vision of it. And then that developed into somebody saying, Well, let's pretend it runs away. So there'd be the runaway train that people would go on and you'd try and frighten them to death and they'd pay good money to be frightened. And then, of course, late in the 19th century, all these places like Blackpool developed enormously. These were full of people from the time they were built until just before the Second World War. And you can see in that picture at least two major structures. There's Blackpool Tower, which was one of the tallest structures in the world at that time. And you can see a big wheel. I'll refer to that later, but that big wheel was uh, taken down before the war. Uh, and there was sort of half a dozen of them throughout the world. And they just go around and there for people to do various things or have a look at the view and things like that. And you can see that Coney Island developed at much the same time. And all these entrepreneurs were trying to invent more ways to get the money off people because that's what it's about. <coughs> and then in the 1920s, these first roller coasters came about. It's the Big Dipper in Blackpool, which always still exists, one roller coaster. And there were other developments in the 1950s when people started making tracks out of steel because you could do a lot more things with steel than you can with wood. You can do nice things with wood, but you could do a lot more things with steel. Now you can make a smoother track, and you can have things that are suspended, and you can have things that uh, go faster and faster. And this is almost the first one I ever worked on, uh, the one with the Pepsi Max at Blackpool, which is the highest in the world at one stage. And uh, I got involved because it didn't work very well, and was asked to see if we could fix the track. And uh, I had to climb over the top of that. And then when we'd fixed it, they said, you will have to go on it first to uh, see if it works. I hate roller coasters. I really hate them. But, you know, one has to do one's duty. I'll tell you one story about that. There's a bit. Uh, I asked the people, there's, there's, when you go on with Pepsi Max, they sort of frisk you to make sure nothing falls out of your pocket. And there's one part where things fall out of They get money because people fall out. And I asked them, what's the strangest thing they ever found? They said, I had a glass eye at one stage. <laughs> but nobody claimed it. <laughs> anyway. And then, of course, it, it's, there's a, a, a challenge to prevent to get more and more sophisticated coasters. So, around the 1990s, things like that. 
This is a suspended looping coaster. There are variations on the theme, but these sorts of coasters are oh yeah. Sorry, just a minute. I think I've pressed the wrong one to be honest. I don't know what should I press? I should go to that one. <coughs> no, 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 I shouldn't. Is this going up? No, it's not working. No, can I go back to the main screen? No. Sorry about this, I'm. Good luck on it. Sorry. So go to there. And then this is another leap forward where it's the first one where people go on a complete revolution. That's uh, dates only from 2002. So that's a sort of brief potted history, and people are forever trying to think of something new because the object is to get the money off the punters to amuse them. And they get bored after a few years, so you always have to change it and do something different. And I'll say a little bit about right design. <clears throat> and design here doesn't just mean mechanics and engineering, it means the whole concept. I'll remember to say this later, but when I came today, I had no choice but to fly an Aer Lingus from Manchester to Cork. You just have to do it. You don't have to go on a ride. You have to persuade people to come on. You have to sell them something. And some of the things I'll sell, I'll talk about in a minute, but in some of the rides, like the London Eye, the thing you sell them is the architectural vision of something that nobody else has got. You're selling them the idea that if they come to London, they have to go on this. So you, when you go to Paris, you have to say you've been on the Eiffel Tower. When you go to London, you have to say you've been on the London Eye. And it's the architectural visit, it's the image that helps. It's not always high class architecture, but in ride design, generally what you're selling, certainly on roller coasters, is the sensation and thrill. And that can vary anything from a children's ride to a white knuckle, do you dare go on this ride and come out alive at the other end. Uh, this is quite an old picture, obviously, so it wasn't so thrilling then. But a modern coaster like this, first of all, you go up that long slope and it goes slowly. So you really got time to get scared before you get to the top. And then when you look over the top and see that, you've got to experience total fear and know you're about to die or something like that. So it's a long drop down. The other things you can play with acceleration. Acceleration is thrilling, various acceleration is thrilling. That's what people are doing cars. So acceleration is a factor that we play with. I don't really design these things. I think I'm one or two, but mostly I do the checking work on and you can sell other things like airtime, that's the feeling when you go to the top and it takes off. Some people like that, so the client might say, well, I'd like some airtime in it. And sometimes you put something additional on. So in this particular case, what happened when you go through the ride, the dinosaur's head bobs down, so it's about to bite you in half. And you really, really think you're going to, it's going to get you. All the big door with the spikes in swings down just as you're going through. And you really think this is the, this is the end. Of course, it's not quite like that, but that's what you've got to believe. So track design, a roller coaster design, usually you've got a site with various geographical constraints and some area. And you try to build in certain features that the client might like. So let's just deal with the physics first of all. Physics is actually dead easy, and it's only A-level physics. So you've got, you start off going up a hill, that gives you certain potential energy, you let the car go from the top, as it loses height, it gets acceleration. Once you know the, once it gets velocity, once you know the velocity, you know the, uh, the forces. And when you go around the bend, uh, you can work out the forces and the accelerations and things like that. So as you come down, you, you're going faster, obviously. And uh, the acceleration is biggest, obviously, when you go around the bend at the bottom, because then you've got gravity plus b squared r going around the bottom. And uh, we can illustrate this quite easily. Well, I hope we can if this thing works. I'll just hang on a second.
we, we just put this on this machine before I came in, so I'd have better run it from the. Uh, hmm? I think I better run it from here. Can you do it from? On my version, it works off the PowerPoint, but. I see a bit of lubrication because it ends up mechanical engineering. And then you get a spade, go around the bank, and you take off, and with a bit of luck. <laughs> Well, I, I, I suspect that's probably a fake, but it, 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 gives, it gives you the general idea. But all this is about the exchange of energy and changing between kinetic but changing between potential energy and kinetic energy and end up in the right place. So I'll just start the carry on. Where's the next one? Um, and the physics are quite simple, just the radio acceleration of B squared upon R, and, and you get force and things like that. And if you make it correct, you can go upside down. This one's a standing coaster, that is just another variation of a thing, but you can make people go upside down if you, if, and you just uh, make sure the velocity is right. You have Another possibility of making people go along, round, and rolling at the same time. So if you go on a coaster like that, you could twist. And all these factors give people a different sensation, because that's what you're selling. So if you go in a vertical direction, when you come, hope you might come down almost free fall. When you go around the bottom of the bend, you have gravity plus the acceleration you feel from the change in direction. But then you, when you're going around in the horizontal direction, just as on a road, you don't want people to jerk over, particularly if you're going on a roll, because their head will swing over. So you have to put a transition curve in to make the change from going horizontally to curve in, in, in a smooth manner because you're dealing with people's safety at the same time. So in general terms, what we've got are giving people a sensation of motion in three directions, three leaps at the same time. So they're going along, down, round, and twisting. And the geometry gets quite complicated. There are, of course, a number of slight complications in that the physics that we've looked at here is the physics of a particle. And in reality, a lot of trains are quite long. So if you take the train on the right, the velocity is governed by where the centroid is in the middle. That means that the back end is going too slow and the front end is going too quick for the position it's at. Now, it doesn't matter if you're going around the curve, but it matters in certain parts of geometry. So if you have a long train like this, the motion you feel at the back related to where you are on the track is different to the middle. Because unlike a road, the train is, has got a length which is short in relation to the curves that you're dealing with on the road, even the car, which is quite short in relation to the transition curves. So some roller coasters are very wide like that to try and simulate the effect of it being a particle and not having this, this complication. And generally speaking, you've got a track, the steel, the track that we do the in is, is uh, steel geometry varying in space in three dimensions and it can get fairly tricky because you're trying to predict what might happen or what you feel like as you're moving through time varying at different speeds and different accelerations along a track which curved in three dimensions but a computer program will do it it just prints out all the different things at uh, different steps. And a big innovation over the last 20 or 30 years has been the ability to curve track, steel track, very accurately. There's ways of doing it that replicate the geometry you require very accurately. But the technical problem in general is that you've got linear velocity and acceleration, radial velocity, 
angular velocity and acceleration all vary with time, and there's a slight issue with longer trains because the front and the back and the middle are different. <coughs> and we have uh, to control those three parameters within certain limits to keep people safe, to make sure they don't, they don't get shaken about too much. And what you would normally do is when the track's built to send cars around an accelerometer and measure and match that to theoretical predictions. And usually it's pretty good. It's not bad to do. What you don't want is it jerking backwards and forwards because people get thrown across and that might hurt their head. And you don't want it to go too quick to, to change to change speed too quickly. But the ideal is to get a very smooth motion as you go all the way around the track. Now, there are ways you can control that because there are things that happen in life that means it's not perfect. We might get a headwind or we might get a tailwind and uh, you've got to have enough velocity to get around the track in the first place so it's always theoretically going too fast unless you've got a big headwind and it's a bit of a disaster if you can't always get around the track. So usually what happens is it goes a bit fast and there are sensors on the track which detect how fast the car is going and they trim the speed automatically at various points. So on a track layout like this, you can see various points of various brakes. This is one of the mechanical engineering aspects. And these brakes might be trim brakes, which just clip, clip, clip something over the coast and slow down a bit, or magnetic brakes, which are a series of magnets under the track, and they can be used by launching the train or slowing it down. And on some rides, of course, not if all else fails, but the thrill is that you're going to end up in a pile of water and that's bound to stop you one way or the other. <clears throat> uh, well, it's, it's, a, it's a deliberate intention. So a coaster is something in motion, changing the space, making sure it's controlled. Uh, the structural engineer's job, obviously, is to, uh, to make the thing stand up. <clears throat> and we have... Uh, Obviously, big wind loads. Uh, you don't send people around in high winds, there's always an operating limit. And that operating limit is sort of an arbitrary one that like, you're not going to send people on a gate, you won't get the customers. And if you've got a really big headwind, you won't get around anyway, so there's certain limits you don't operate in. But often you get a very skinny structure like this. And we don't care too much about the deflections. Most of the time, it's not very windy, and we're not too bothered about it. They'll never notice, people will never notice as they're going around. There are some thermal problems because the track is continuous and very long, and the expansion of the track is an issue, and expansion and contraction. But if it's a big curved track, the expansion is taken up by the radius just increasing on the flexibility of the supports. You really don't want any joints in it if you can avoid it, uh, for reasons which I'll explain in a bit. So there's a thermal case to look at. And generally speaking, the track is pitched with a camber to try and uh, make sure the centre of force goes through the track as you, as you would on the road. And this is where there's a problem with long trains and short track, because if you've got a long train, which is at the wrong speeds at the back and the front, it doesn't match the camber. And that makes people either uncomfortable or it puts extra forces on the track in a way that you might not want. So, although it's not technically complicated, there's a lot of numerical stuff just to check what the forces are at each point and to check the track at each point. And if you've got a, a complicated coaster like this, it, it's quite messy to sort out, but there are people who used to do it, those people who do it are used to doing it. And it's not really that difficult. The thing that is different, one thing that is different, is this magic word fatigue. Now mechanical engineers will be more familiar with fatigue than structural engineers. In most structural engineering applications, fatigue doesn't exist. It, it sort of exists on bridges, but just pause for a minute and think about, look at the picture of a bridge. Fatigue life is inversely proportional to the stress range cubed that stress range, that the change in stress on the structure. And a bridge, the majority of the road is the self-weight. 
gravity. That doesn't change. The bit that moves are cars, they don't weigh very much, and there's a lot of them. So that changes, but an enormous amount. And the ratio of the bridge weight to a car weight is obviously dominated by the bridge. So the, although there is fatigue on the bridge, not really that bad. If you contrast that with the roller coaster, there's nothing, the track weighs nothing. So one minute there's no load on the track, the next minute there's a coaster, which is the dominant load, and it's got lots of wheels, and it weighs more than it looks because it's got this gravity curvature effect, and it's nastily got lots and lots of wheels which stomp the track. So fatigue and coping with fatigue is a dominant issue. Unfortunately, it's not entirely predictable. I mean, you can do the mathematics. But if you think about the, the arithmetic of stress range Q, you need to change one number a small amount, and it makes big differences in the actual life. So you have to both predict what the life is, and sign it, and you have to have an inspection regime to check and catch fatigue failure before it goes too far. Really, it's a very serious issue. And these are some examples of what might happen. So if you look at the track on the right, you, you imagine there's a slight misalignment, the wheels come over and thump, the one in the rear, it's tube, so it starts to squash, it's thin walled, you get a horizontal stress longitudinally, and you get fatigue cracks developing. So the thing which tends to govern the thickness of the track is not the thing you would first think about, all the stress and constraints from what I've just described earlier, but local effects on fatigue and this hammer that it gets from the wheels. And what is that force? Well, it depends on the tolerance, it depends on the impact, it, you know, it's never entirely predictable. And the one on the left, that is this goes you can go through in weeks if you're not careful. But sometimes it catches you where you don't think. So there's quite a famous case of, a, this is one case of seat fatigue. So I advise you next time you go on a roller coaster, just have a look at the seat behind you to make sure it's okay. And here's a very other nasty case. Uh, I do is go out and inspect this wheel. And you can see that the cracks from the stress concentration at the end of the gussets on the left, my fingers. You can see the cracks there. And I had to tell this guy, your wheel scrap. He hadn't even opened it. And it's because if you're inexperienced, you just don't realize that fatigue is the dominant design issue it is. So that's a big problem. And any structural engineer will know, any mechanical engineer will know the stress concentrations that the and some gusts and things like that, so very nasty problem. Sometimes it can catch you out as well. This is a suspended coaster, and you tracks on the top with wheels, and you sit in these seats. Obviously, it's very expensive. And in testing, one of the uh, well, the seats fell off. And if you think about it, you may experience this on the train. Let's tell you go on a train or a tram at a certain speed. It happens in the Manchester Metro. I keep meaning to write about it. But as you go down the track, if there's a mismatch between the track and the, where it starts to oscillate in plan, this thing oscillated in plan, the front and the back start to swing about. So it's a dynamic effect. And uh, the seat was on a, a, a junction like that. There's a a well with a notch in its uh, in, uh, at the root, and it just fatigued through in a matter of days and fell off. So one feature of the steam rides, and these are common things in theme park rides, but one feature is that structurally you have to know more about fatigue, you have to know more about dynamics, you have to know more about wells, well inspection, and the details of welding that give you a long and prolonged fatigue life and the ability for safety terms to be able to predict and catch it before it gets too far. Very demanding. I'll say something about uh, large wheels now, because um, I've worked on a lot of them. 
Uh, this is the, the, the first one that was uh, ever built, Mr. Place, in America, in, uh, I think, I haven't got a watch up in the book at all. It's the first one built by Mr. Paris in America, which was 80 metres tall. And it wasn't much of a commercial success. But um, a lot of people copied it around the world. And that one at Blackpool you saw was a copy. There was one in London, there was one in Paris, and various other places. And uh, in terms of the RIBA Architectural Award, it's not going to win anything, it's fairly utilitarian, it looks like a bunch of old railway carriages hung on the side, which is actually what um, this is the more famous one is. Uh, this is the one from the Third Man in Vienna, and it's still there, and uh, you can go on it, it's a historic ride, you can have a quite nice ride on it. But the carriages are not going to win any particular prizes, it's, uh, it's full of nostalgia and those of you who've seen the film The Third Man will, will know all about it. The one on the right, of course, is the improved version and that is the architectural dream of the people who uh, came up with the idea. And this is important for the architecture students because what you have to do is sell something. You know, you have to, you're trying to, this is not cheap, but what you're trying to tell the world is you must go on this because it's the most elegant, beautiful wheel in the world and you haven't been to London unless you've been on it. So a lavish amount of time is spent on making it aesthetically nice. And it was and is a, a huge, still, still a huge success. And I, had a, I had the privilege of working on this for a long time and I, I still occasionally do work on it. And that's 135 metres high. <coughs> um, there is another one in Singapore, which is slightly bigger, 165 metres, uh, but that isn't as successful. And it's simply because there aren't enough people to go on it. If I asked any of you in this audience, have you been to Singapore, there would be some people who have, but if I asked you why would you go to Singapore, you'd sort of think for a bit and say, well, I stopped over on the way to somewhere else. So there's not a vast amount of people. There's absolutely no point in building one in Cork. Well, the London Eye has the whole population of Ireland, four million people going through it every year. And that makes it commercially viable. You just don't have enough people. So if you think about that, there's not many places you can build it. London has 30, 40 million visitors, tourists a year. So it's that commercial aspect that makes the difference. And amongst other things, it's also got a great site. But if you just mentally go over cities in Europe and think, well, where would you get a good site? Where can you operate 365 days a year? Anywhere that's too cold, you can't. Who gets a lot of tourists? You, you, you pretty soon run out of sites. There's nowhere else in England that would be a remote revival. Because London is London. If you take a city like New York, it's perishing in the winter. You know, who's going to track around in the winter? You know? I went to Moscow to look at one of these things. It's absolutely dreadful in the winter. Nobody's going to go there. There is another one, and that's, uh, I didn't work on this one. I worked on the one on the top right, but they decided they couldn't afford it and dropped out. But this is in Las Vegas. Actually, it's in the parking lot. So when you go on it, you, you can't see anything until you get halfway up. I, I don't know how well it's doing, but it's very sophisticated. And the capsules turn two ways and round at the same time. But Las Vegas is Las Vegas. So I don't know how well it's doing. And it's very elegant and it looks very nice. And there's this urge of people to build one that's the biggest in the world. Actually, it's commercially stupid to do that because there's, there's absolutely no point. Uh, so reasons that, uh, well, first of all, the cost is probably proportional to the square of the diameter. Um, so it becomes much more expensive. Those of you who've been, I, I presume a lot of people, how many people just for example have been on the London Eye? Right, well, that's perfect. There's, I have spoken on the London Eye in five continents, everywhere somebody puts hand on. But those of you who've been, been on it will know that 
it, it can, it's only viable if it works continuously. And that means the speed relative to the platform is fixed. Okay. So if you have a bigger wheel, you can't get any more people or revenue. The revenue is the length of the queue and how fast you can get on it and how fast you can take the money off. So a bigger wheel doesn't get any more revenue. It costs you a lot more money. And secondly, like my wife worries about, you know, it's over 30 minutes and worry where the toilet is. So you don't want to be on it more than 30 minutes because people get bored anyway. So if you double the diameter, as we've seen, 200 meters, what are they going to do? They'll get fed up. They'll be worried about going to the toilet. It'll cost you a huge amount more money. And unless you've got, I mean, the London Eyes never run to capacity. I mean, it's got a deep point when it first opened, we had to sort of push to try and get maximum one, but most of the time, it's nowhere near capacity. So there's commercially no sense in going particularly big. But people try it. I worked on this one in Beijing, and it was very entertaining to work on it. I loved going to China, it was mostly built, but it was never finished off. And uh, that was supposed to be 208 metres high. But uh, I don't know how many of you, you, you just look at the site for a start, think about, think about the site. What can you see from that site? And those of you who know, you know, think your mind back to the Beijing Olympics, what's the one weather condition you remember? Smog. I mean, Kieran told me today he went to London to see the London night, it was foggy, didn't see anything. Right. Fog's not so bad in London, but Beijing, believe me, you know, it's smoggy. And there's no transport facilities to it, so I'm going to get there. So a lot of it was built, but I'm afraid it was just never finished off. Well, maybe it will be, I don't know. It's some time ago now. And uh, it did have 48 capsules in it, and, and one of the cost saving measures, you can only have symmetrical numbers of capsules, 48, 24, something like that was to make it 24, but that was impossible because the word for 24 in Chinese is uh, which sounds like death, so nobody would go on it, so it was absolutely forbidden to have 24. So you can't have 25, you can't have 26, so not a problem. Now there is another one mooted, which I've also done something about, uh, and that's 210. Now they've got oodles of money and probably don't care so that probably will open. Uh, but you can see these are massive structures in their own right and, and they're huge engineering projects and they require a lot of integration of the engineering. A sensible design, which is ultimately sustainable, doesn't require any energy and is reusable for firewood and nothing else, is this one. And I'm sure the people who did it got a great deal of satisfaction, and uh, I'm sure it works very well. Now, putting that to one side, these, these things are, and I'll use this as an example for the students then. This is the one that I, and here's a, an example of the integration of lots of different systems. You need a drive system if you're going to turn it, you need power to turn that. You need bearings in the middle, which is the mechanical engineering. The mechanical engineering is the bearings in the drive system. And you need the structure on the outside, and of course you need the capsules. And the capsules are sort of the architectural gem. They are the image that sells everything. Commercially, there's absolutely no point in having an egg-shaped capsule. It's frightfully expensive, and the glass is very, very difficult to make. And also, if you can think back to what this summer was like in England, and think now about if you were doing the students and you were doing a risk assessment, what's the obvious hazard of a glass capsule in the summer that we've just had if the wheel stops? Every year, there are children and dogs killed in cars which are sealed in the sun. So that's one example of how you have to think in terms of safety. Because you have to say to yourself, I've got 40 people inside a goldfish bowl. What happens if it stops? And the answer to that is it can't stop. The safety case has to be, under all credible circumstances, you can turn the wheel. 
And for me, I think the biggest technical challenge we have to deal with was the air conditioning inside the capsules. So think about that. You've got these people, you have to provide air conditioning and climate control over winter and summer, reckoning that it will be very hot. You've got a huge amount of heat coming in through glassy, you know, double glazed, and those various things. You've got to let people see the view. So the technical challenges that manifest themselves in these projects, and not the first obvious, are serious. And air conditioning is a very difficult problem. So in safety terms, there are double air conditioning units in case form fails. Just testing to make sure it's all right. We did soup it up afterwards. And then you've got whole wheels got to turn inside the mechanical system. You need power to it. You need power for the uh, for the air conditioning units that you've got to get to. And you've got to think through in terms of a project, how are you going to get all these things there and still make it look nice? And that's one example of this integration of the different engineering disciplines. There are some effects of scale uh, for structural engineers and some particular challenges. So uh, a good way of avoiding some of those problems that you saw on the fatigue with the rigid spokes is to have cables. Now, cables are a special area of technology that perhaps people who do suspension bridges understand, but not many other people. And if you look on this comparison between London and Singapore, you can see the cables sag. Now, as the wheel turns round, the cables sag in the opposite direction. So there's a second fatigue case at the fixing of the cables as they move backwards and forwards. So the fatigue turns an issue. And the bigger the bigger the diameter, the bigger the sag. And it's not easy to change a cable. They are, they are capable of being changed, but these are machines. And income stems from keeping them going every day to bring the income in. So you really, really don't want them to be stopped. So maintenance, the ability to change things, all has to be built in the design to ensure the commercial viability is still there. You will have to change the cable sometime. It's, it's not an easy task. Another technical aspect that you have to think about is cable vibration. Well, there's a number of cases on suspension bridges, just like a violin string or any of them. It's when the wind flows past a circular object, it'll start to oscillate. An inadvertent oscillation of bridges and cables and things like that. Everyone's seen the film of Tacoma Narrows. Right? That sort of dynamic problem is something that comes with scale. It's an area of technology you've got to think about and be aware of. So all these cables are damped and controlled. And then there are areas like the hub and spindle. So we've had um, 20, nearly 20 years now, 20, you know, nearly 50 million visitors. And they all sit on one piece of steel. The whole structure, the whole rim sits on one piece of steel. So just think about that. If that goes wrong, you lose the entire project. And it's a safety issue if it fails. So you ask yourself, what's an appropriate safety factor for a, for a cantilever on which the whole project, 18 million pounds, plus all those visitors depends? When we think about that in a bit more detail, it's even more complicated, because this is a very thick piece of steel. And it's got a big weld in it, and it's cold, and the hazard is fracture, which is rapid. If it bends, everybody will be getting annoyed, but it won't kill anybody. But if it fractures, it's the end. So the technical challenge on this is, how do you make something that's incredibly reliable with a weld and very thick steel, and its operating conditions are cold? And I won't go into it now, I've given that up, but it's extremely, it's a very important topic and a very interesting one. And in, and in bridges which are external with very thick steel on, if some of the steels are 200 millimeters thick. And one of the answers is to cut the safety factor down to make the steel as thin as possible. Another aspect of the technology of some of these rides is something we should pay more attention to in most of the buildings we do is how do you build them? 
So I challenge for students, and for all of us actually, in, in work, as so we're gaining experience, is to marry the skills of doing calculations of design and how you build something. And the reason uh, there's some bridge engineers in here, I know, and bridge engineers will know that in the construction stage, the dominant design case which governs member size is often the construction stage. How do you build the bridge? You start from how you build the bridge first and then do the number crunch it afterwards. So here at the London Eye, there's a challenge of how we're going to build this. And we've got a very, very short program. We've got one year to do it in. So the answer was to build it in a day. And uh, those of you who haven't seen it, it's one, two, three, four. Now that added, uh, I said, I, I, there was a gentleman over there, I said there was, I couldn't say anything about civil engineering, but I've just remembered something, so I'll say it to him, because he's, I know we've got some civil engineers, let me see. So, for the students among you, and if somebody wants to set an exam question, if I put the wheel there, and you just look at that through and ask yourself, uh, what's the biggest load on the rear foundation? See if I can do it. How do I switch this off? So I'm making some of this as I go. How do I press? Middle. Underneath. Underneath. Oh, right. So there's vertical load down there. Goes up to there. Down there. The foundation is down there. So if you think about it for just a minute or five seconds. Oh, go the other way. At that point, that's most eccentric to that. So the biggest load on the foundation is the moment that comes off the supports. So the whole foundation design is governed by the erection condition. That's obvious when you think about it, but we paid an extra four million pounds to be able to build it in a day. Because the program was tight, the client wanted a program. But that's just one example of how important it is and how difficult it is for all of us, and especially young people, to get this overall experience that allows you to see what it is you've got to design and what's going to govern the design. So there's obviously here the erection condition also meant you've got to build the columns with hinges there in order to bring it up to the top. Uh, for those of you, I don't know how many of you can remember what remember it on the day, but the first time we did it, I nearly dropped it. It's a bit embarrassing, but the only time I've made used at 10. I don't want to do it again. But we had a cable break and it was going up. Um, anyway, it got up and it stayed there ever since. Uh, let me say something about mechanical and electrical systems. This is the, the main bearing of the London Eye. It's, it's a huge one. So in project terms, it takes about a year to get. There's only two places in the world you can get them. It's another example of integration of the systems. And another aspect of uh, technology that's not immediately obvious is the lubrication. Believe me, this is lubricated daily with loving, tender care because there's no way of changing it. Everything else you can change, fix, but can't change this. So there's lubrication pumped in like it's gone out of fashion, you know, like it doesn't cost anything. Because if it fails, the whole project fails. So we did a lot of experiments on lubrication and the right lubricant to do it, and it's quite a difficult thing to procure, quite a difficult thing to get. These are the mechanical drive systems. You have to think how you turn it around. And the same goes for a roller coaster. You can launch roller coasters, or you can there are various ways of doing that, usually just take them off the track on the chain. Uh, but here you have a drive system with wheels, and rubber tires, so area of technology of rubber tires. And you might see there are four lots of tires in there. And for the students, again, this is thinking about safety. Because any mechanical item like your car will go wrong. Not in Jeremiah, it will at some stage fail. The clutch will go, you'll get a puncture, you know, global heat, one of the sensors will fail something. The principle is it will fail. So you have to build into a design 
with the possibility of something failing and say, what can we do about it? So you have redundancy and diversity, which means you've got more than you need, and you split it up into different areas, and you feed power in different ways. So if one bit fails, you've always got one bit that will see you through. So the concept of design on a roller coaster something is recovery. You must be able to recover people and get them off. And that requires that you have multiple diversity, and that's part of the engineering process of design. Now this is the transfer of electrical to the power, because you need electrical onto the rim to feed the air conditioning units, to feed the lights, to feed all sorts of things. So the integration of electrical systems and the diversity of electrical systems is... Is there any control engineers in the audience? Well, that's another good example then. Nobody put their hand up. There are some mechanical engineers, yes. Mechanical? Not mechanical. Well, a bit of mechanical. Electrical? Yes, a bit electrical. But no control engineer. So for the students, this illustrates a really good point. Here's an interface of technology that nobody in this audience knows anything about. And that's inherently dangerous, because if you know nothing about it, you can't spot the problems. If you look at uh, various accidents in history, they're often associated with a control system. Uh, you, I mean, everyone's sort of familiar with the control system. There's room, there's, there's lights, there's a switch, there's uh, <coughs> cables, and there's lights. And if one light goes, you can always replace another one. If that switch goes, you can't switch the lights on. If the cable breaks, you can't get the lights on. So it's a system, but it's not safe relating because if the lights don't work, it's not the end of the world. But if you think about a system where you absolutely has to work, where it absolutely has to stop, how do you configure the system so that when you say stop, it will stop? When you say go, it will go. And many of you are familiar with the problem of modern cars where it says it's overheating, you don't know if it's really overheating or it's the sensor. And it's the problem of an automatic response to a sensor. So if you had a sensor that said uh, you're overheating and stop the car, you'd be stuck in the middle of the motorway and you wouldn't know what to do about it. So there's this dilemma about controlling things. And it's uh, a big area, a very interesting area of technology. So on a roller coaster, There'll be all sorts of sensors on the track which check the speed, check it's still on the track. And like a railway system, it will tell you whether the train's gone or where it is. So if you're sending multiple trains down a track, you want to know whether there's one in front before you launch the one behind. So what went wrong on the Smiler was the control system did what it thought it should do. There was a car on the track and stopped. And the control system realized it was stopped and prevented the next one moving. But the operators came out and didn't see it because it was in a ditch. And they wanted to get the passengers off, so they overrode the control system. But unbeknown to them, they should have known, was a second car on the track. So the two cars collided. So, for instance, on a roller coaster, you have to think this through. You know, you're sending cars through. This is the problem on signalling on a railway track. You're sending trains down the track. How do you know there's one in front of you? So it's a very interesting area, a very difficult area. But there are sensors on the track which tell you those various things. They're all linked to into a control system which both informs people. And you can, if you think it's appropriate, make an automatic response. But it's sometimes difficult to know when you should do it. So here's uh, the picture, for instance, of the, some of the information you get back from the capsules on the modern eye. And there are fire sensors, there are smoke sensors, there are, tells you whether the door is open or closed, uh, tells you whether the tilt system is working. So if you think, for example, about the door, the door seems a very simple thing, the door over there. You go on the London eye through the door and it closes. Now, if it opens at height and you fall out, you're dead. See? So you have to be sure 
the control the door is closed. So how do you know the door's closed? Well the control system has a sensor that checks the door is closed. And then you think, well, if it's not closed, we don't want any fallout. So the sensor will then make sure that the reel cannot work if the door is open. And you say, well, what happens if the sensor fails? So you have redundancy and you have a boat. In this case of the London Eye, there are three locks on the door. There's a mechanical one, an electrical one, and a human being. Now, the human being is not very reliable. If you have a human being anywhere, it'll make a mistake. But it's better than nothing. And the reason you have an electrical one and a mechanical one is that if you have both electrical ones, theoretically, they could both fail, especially if they come from the same batch. So you have a different one. And that gives you extra reliability in mathematical computer. So there's some things that's automatic. The smoke sensors, you don't want to be automatic. You want to know the smoke there, but you don't want to stop because then the people will stop the smoke in it. So what you want then is an alarm system that tells you to speed the wheel up and get them off. And the other sensors can control things and tell you whether something's happening. So there's information. There's records about what needs maintaining or gone wrong. And the logic system of building up the design has to be how do you do it to make sure it's safe. So there's another control system. There's the uh, picture from the capsules on the one line which tells you whether people are in them or not. And uh, whether it's rotated, which way it's rotated, things like that. You also have to, uh, only of these things emergency stops. Just like you put your foot down on the brake, you know, and that cuts off all power immediately because you've got to have the facility on any moving machine to stop it. And you don't want it to go under control, you don't want it to stop it. And that's where the dinosaur comes in, because you're going down, this dinosaur comes down to bite you. How do you know it's going to stop? In engineering terms. How do you know the thing that says stop is not faulty and going over the limit? Now, you don't need to know how to do it here, but you be aware that there is such a thing as a control system. It is possible to design it with various degrees of reliability. You run a nuclear power station, you're obviously at the top level. And the levels of reliability on these are set extremely high. Because you certainly don't want the head to come down and crash with the car. You want it to come down far enough to scare the living daylights out of people as they go underneath it. So this aspect of safety is extremely important. Things that have gone wrong. Example here. This is uh, another example. All these rides are cleared off, but here's a little boy, toddler left on his own, walked through the safety barrier on the outside and got hit. And this is the incident on, you've probably forgotten it now if you ever knew about it, the Singapore Flyer, where the wheel stopped and they couldn't get it turned again, so they had to rescue people from height. And there was a fundamental flaw in the safety case logic. Because uh, they had a, a, an electrical unit, which everyone thought was incredibly reliable, and it faulted. So they cut the power off and stopped dead. That's fine, you stop things dead. But the logical step is to say, well, how do I get people off? And the brakes on these are the opposite to a car. So on the car you put your foot and the brakes come on. On the most safety related things the brakes are on unless you've got power to get them off. And here the brakes defaulted sprung on, but nobody had any power to get them off. So then you've got people stuck 100 meters in the air, inability to turn something. And that's why it's so difficult when you need this group of people to do a structured process of looking to a safety argument and faulting each individual bit to see what the consequences are and configure the whole design so that you never end up in that position. A fundamental requirement, basic case is passengers are safely contained. So in a car, when you're in the car, the doors are locked, you're contained in the car and you can't fall out. That's fine, as long as you can open it to get out. So the passenger containment on the London Eye is you're in the capsule, you're safe because the doors are triple locked. The corollary of that is you have to be able to get out, which leads you to an engineering demand for extreme reliability on the drive system and the power supply. 
you know, we might have a power cut for the next five minutes, but this hotel might have an emergency generator that can kick in. And on a roller coaster, there are steps by the side because the principle is that, you know, if it stops midair, you can get people off on the steps if you have to. And then there's the technology of lap bars. Every car now has a, uh, you know, safety straps. But on a roller coaster, if it's a kiddies one, you might end up with just a lap bar. But on one of these fierce rides, you will have full over the shoulder containment. An object that is, uh, there are certain rules in the codes about it. If it's an above certain acceleration limit, you don't want people to fly out. So uh, the control system will also check, as it does on your car, my car says you haven't got the seat belt on. There's a sensor on the seats. And if you don't want the seat belt on, there's a warning. So on these coasters, there'll be sensors on the control system, and the car will not go if someone is in the seat and the sensor does say you're not, you're not locked in properly. And it's very sophisticated things like that. But you can get underneath and get people off. Another standard safety issue is that you know people stand up, but if you're not careful, they stand up and they're chopped off. But they put their arms out and do all sorts of crazy things. So there is a safety envelope around all of them, uh, which is checked like that. And we send a car around with things stuck on the outside to make sure nothing sticks. And you have these models of people that can do it to, to check the geometry. And you always consider everything's considered that might fall off. There's always a secondary system. Because if you do have a fatigue failure or something breaks, if all else fails, it's hung on by something else. And a lot of, many of these stem from a famous failure. That's why it's important to study failures that occurred in Battersea Funfair in the 1950s when the car went up the track. Something failed, it rolled back down the track and killed or injured five children. So this clackety clack you can hear is a ratchet and pole system. So that if the chain system which pulls you up the track fails, it can't fall down the track. So safety is taken extremely seriously. And there's always a Solange rollback system like that with a pole and ratchet in it to stop the track. In anticipation that something might fail and something to catch you. And then you always send test dummies around to make sure it works. But at the end of the day, somebody's got to be, uh, you know, brave enough to try it. And these two people are obviously quite happy to have a go. Anyway, that's two minutes past eight. So uh, here's a, an example of a, a very sophisticated machine. You can see that, that it's going around the track and it's people turning like that. So it involves all the disciplines that I've talked about uh, this evening. And uh, it should be also for the students an interesting example of how diverse our industry in construction is. When you start in on a university course, you know, you do various lectures, and it's probably impossible for you to imagine all the different routes and all the different specialities that can exist in architecture, in mechanical, or civil, or structural engineering. And that will come with time. But what you should do as young people is look at everything that's available. Look at what excites you. And this is a fantastic area to work in. You know, I don't know how I got into it, but it's, you know, it's just serendipity. But there's lots of very interesting things to do. And it's a fantastic career. And I wish you well with it. Thank you. Anyone wants to ask any questions? I'll do it. Ask any questions. Any questions on the floor? Mark? Everyone just had a hand. Thanks, Mark, for your talk. And just before that, this was written. Is there a central governing body? Is there a standard release inspection regime? Well, I understand a lot of the structures are quite unique. Oh, absolutely, yes. It's very highly regulated. That's where I get most of my work, or where I did most of my work. There is a special regulatory regime 
where every ride has to be certified. And we were discussing the, the, this before on, on bridges. It's we in, in building generally the culture of checking things has failed and fallen by the wayside. It's stupid. It's short-sighted. It's expensive for everyone. But it's daft. But in the rides industry. Every ride has to be independently checked before, because it's the public that are at risk. You know, you can't, what's wrong for all of us is to put the public at risk when they've got no control over it. So the, the check is the theoretical check, the, the design, and it has to encompass this big word design, not just the numbers. It's, has it been built the way you thought it was built? So there's a check on, it conforms. And then when it's open, you've seen that uh, there's a check on it works. And when we say it works, you've seen me describe various faults. So the check will fault various things. You'll deliberately try to stop the doors closing. You'll open the doors and say, press the button, see if it works. If it works, there's something wrong with it. You know? but you, in order to do that checking, you have to understand the totality of the design. So you might, for instance, send a train round and stop it, and then send another train round, hopefully, so that it will stop before it crashes into the other one. So yes, it's a very strict regime. Sometimes things go wrong. The, 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 the failure, what you, what's difficult to legislate for is we have to anticipate human error. Humans are terrible people, how they make mistakes? So the, the problem with a smiler was a human error problem. And that's very hard to control. So there are procedures as well. Yes, anything else? I'm going to ask you a question actually. I see, you know, I found the slides to do with fatigue very interesting and said the process of doing a full fatigue inspection of a roller coaster after hearing use must be a very onerous task. What's the process? You, you can't. Yeah. Because there are just too many wells. Okay, so what you do on the design is usually, like in everything we do, there's, there's some areas that are more vulnerable than others. And the safety philosophy for fatigue has to be that uh, it doesn't progress far enough before you can catch it. So you have to design the welds so that the fatigue from the outside in, not the inside out, because then you can see it. What's dangerous? It comes from the inside out. And you know you want the, you want it to be tolerable to a crack that's big enough to see. You know, if it's, if it's one millimetre long and it fails, you're in trouble, but if it's 20 millimetre, you know, 30 mil long, you can catch it. And then there's usually, for instance, on the one tonight, there's a rolling programme of annual inspections. And uh, on any roller coaster, there's a rolling programme. The one thing that's, that's going for you is that on a bridge, it works, you know, 365 days a year. But the season for a roller coaster is only five or six months, so you've got six months to fix something. So, and they only last, uh, people get bored after five or six years, so they don't last that long normally. So there are one or two things in your favour, but it is a very onerous. And engineers have to understand about NDT and all this stuff, examination and what you're looking for. Any questions from the floor? Yeah. You mentioned those safety factors earlier, and you there aren't any increased safety. You've done any increased safety factors on top of very usual one point three by one point five years. I mean, well, safety factors are routine for, for building, but <coughs> safety factors have to be routine for building. But you have to use your sense. And, you know, it, it just <coughs> clients off in. It, it is fundamentally untrue that the least weight structure paired down to the bone is the best structure. You know, if you want something, if the revenue depends on something working all the time and you can put a bit more robustness in, that is a sensible thing to do. So it's, it's and that applies not just to roller coaster, it applies to everything. Now clients don't always understand that, but like I said on the long line, everything depends on one piece of steel, you, you really, really think what is an appropriate margin of safety and how can I demonstrate it? The paradox in there is that the thicker you make the steel, the higher you make the risk of fracture. So what you want is as low a safety factor, and that's the worst mode of failure than bending. Because if you think about that, 
as a structure. You've got the basic, you've got a cantilever, which is absolutely fixed in length. You've got a load, you know for absolute certainty. Dead weight, because you weighed it. So the bending moment cannot be wrong. You know a particular steel, it's not just the mill certificate from any old kind. You know, so you know the steel, you know that. So what are the variables that will persuade you you need to pick a load of that, apart from general unease about it? Mathematically, you know it for certain. So if you look at the structures article, it will say we reduce the safety factor to as low as we thought was justified because fear of fracture is worse than fear of bending, which sounds odd thing to do, but there we are. You reduce the safety factor to improve the safety. Sounds stupid, but you know what I mean. But, and in, if you think about what I showed you about that fatigue fear at joints, the track on a roller coaster is often governed by those local effects. So the bending stress is a bit, a, 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 you know, they're not really important. It's, it's local effects often that are an easy sense about it. Anyone else? John? Thanks for uh, an excellent presentation, first of all. Uh, my question is in relation to the Illuminati and how we consider terrorism, which has been designed originally, and that consideration to be revised in recent decades. The answer is yes, and the answer is I'm not going to tell you anymore. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, 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 in fact, it was occupied in its first year by people who had a protest, actually. And I had to go down, and the police asked me what to do. And it was December, and I said, well, turn the heating off, and when they want the cold enough, they might go to the toilet or come down. But they can't escape. So the answer is yes, it's an obvious target, and it was on somebody's list. But if you've been on it, and you think about it, ask yourself, where could you secrete anything? And the answer is you can't, because it's been designed for that. If you think about the geometry, of the approach. I'm not going to describe it in detail. You think how you could get a run with a vehicle. You can't. There's a security check when you go on, but we have to balance it with three. It's a bit like a security check at the airport, you know, you don't know, be a balance. There are discrete listening devices, there are CCTV cameras in every capsule watching them. Uh, it might be against local current thinking, but there is. So the answer is yes, but there's only so much you can do. And then if you think about this from an engineering perspective, and you think about the size of the members, how would you, what could you do to bring it down? How could you credibly do it? Just look at the size of if you look at the, if you look at the way the columns are detailed, there's a, a piece of concrete as tall as this building, tall as this room at the bottom, okay? Which is you know meters thick. Yeah, I'm not gonna bust that. So you can't actually get up to the columns. So actually when you think about it, it would be quite hard to do. You could make a fuss about it. And uh, can't get away, but the, the, the problem for all of us is that um, getting away is no longer a deterrent for lots of people because the object is to get attention to yourself and to do something. So that might be a bit tricky. Cases we've had in London, the people who attacked didn't care whether they were killed or not. So it, it, it's a problem we all have to face on lots of structures. Yes, ma'am. At what stage were you brought in to design? Which design? For the London Eye. Uh, at the end of night. Well, what happened was, um, <clears throat> I actually shouldn't record this, but <laughs> there was another contractor, a Japanese contractor, who um, sort of lost enthusiasm, shall we say. And the client was left with uh, 16 months. No design, no team and uh, no one to do it. And so I was approached by one of the contractors, saying, well, what do you think? 
And I'll tell you this, our directors came to me and said, well, have you ever done this before? And I said, no. Is there a code of practice? I said, no. Is the client got a specification? I said, no. What happens if it goes wrong? Well, we lose the company. Well, that's a good idea, we'll do it then. <laughs> what it tells you, and again, this is important for young people, we did it in 16 months. Now, the only way you can do that and all of your experienced engineers will know that. If you have absolute confidence in the people you work with and you trust them, there is no substitute for trust. And our client trusted us absolutely, just said, do it, get it right, and send me the bill. If you have a team that is determined to win and willing to work with each other and not blame each other, you can perform miracles. If you don't have that, you're doomed. And we had a team that was determined to work together and to do it. And that's makes all the difference. That's the difference. It's human beings. You know. I'm just going to say a little bit more about um, modeling and dynamic behavior. Obviously, it's dominant in the vast domains, but in something like a solid carbon field, do you set your own criteria for things like the optical? Fundamental resonance, and do you use the same sort of criteria as you would for example for pedestrian bridge? No, um, no. So when I say let me let me take the first part. <clears throat> In most structures, dynamics isn't an issue, and when you're on a moving structure, when you're on a train. You've thrown them out all over the place and you don't worry about it. If that happened in this building, you all go through that door. You know, what? So there's a context of it. And on a coaster, you've been thrown about all over the place. You wouldn't notice anyone. Um, and it's not normally an issue. So there's never really any sort of deliberate dynamic analysis of a track. But you, there are certain dynamic effects like the stomping, which are intangible. If you go back to the, and the problem with, the historical problem with dynamics is that, uh, and it still occurs, when you respond to things like that, is when people are completely unaware of the concept of dynamics, um, they just miss it out and then it catches them out. So there are a number of structures in the UK, which are just like the coma narrows, when you think about it, because they didn't know, and it just started to oscillate. If you look at the London Eye and you're looking across it, you obviously know something about dynamic. There's a mass, which is the wheel, and there's a cable. So, in effect, it's a mass of a long spring. And the fear is that an oscillating wind could start to do it like that. So, there are dampers all the way around the rim, chin mass dampers all the way around the rim to stop it oscillating. It never has moved. And uh, if you go in a big wind, I've been up in the wind, but you know, you're not allowed to go up there. You can't really feel it very much. And if it's moving, people are walking around the floor, people don't notice it anyway. You, you can feel it move if you just close your eyes and stand on the top in a fairly gusty conditions. But providing it's moving, people look at it, they don't notice anything. So there's never been that feedback. I don't know of, uh, I don't know of another one that oscillates. Oh. And one problem, sometimes it happens. Uh, uh, it always happens on a Friday night, doesn't it? So, uh, w there was a chap on a theme park, and he, he had a, a tower which was a helter skelter. And he didn't like the look of it, I think. So he clad it. And it was a square object which was light and clad, and it started to shake about some of the wind buffeted. And it was, you know, it's, we had to go out and hurriedly take the cladding off because it was dynamically. Shove itself to finish it really. So you, you get you know, all sorts of things crop up. It's not really a sort of thing you can't do. Any final questions from the floor? I think I'm mindful of time. Well, in decades, I'm going to ask Mary Maloney, she's former chair of the region. So before, have I put anyone off being an engineer? <laughs> <laughs> no, good. That's another, another unanimous uh, response. So I'm going to call Mary Maloney. Past year in the region to uh, give the vote. Thanks. Thanks, Mary.
I'm, I'm just a speaker, <laughs> so maybe I don't need it. Um, can I just first of all congratulate you on a, a most inspiring uh, presentation here this evening and to congratulate the Institute of Structural Engineers in Ireland and the Cooperation of Engineers for inviting Alan and hosting this evening. I personally have found it incredible. I think the whole, um, I suppose uh, we have students here from a number of different branches and we have structural engineers, we have civil engineers, but we really are a multidisciplinary um, career. And I think that's what you've really brought out today. We have mechanical engineers, I see some of my colleagues from CIT, and how we all relate together and how we're all interdependent on each other is another thing that was very much clear in, in your presentation this evening. I think another thing, whether we're architects or we're engineers, client satisfaction. I personally am not big into rides, okay, but my, the rest of my family are. And again, client satisfaction in, in theme park rides or client satisfaction in our buildings or in our roads is very, very important. And again, as I say, in theme parks, just as important. I suppose what you have done is you've given us a whisk stop tour of what is engineering. So we've gone from, you know, as you say, A level or leaf and search um, applied maths or physics right through to control and the whole design of control systems and power systems and the interdependencies, the resilience, the redundancy. So all of the things that we cover as engineers, you brought them all here tonight in a magnificent showcase of structural engineering. So I would just like to thank you all on behalf of all of the audience for the time and the superb presentation. And I will be dreaming of the exam questions with the architects. So don't you worry. Okay. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.